Welcome to the Light Reading Podcast. We're live at the Big 5G event in Denver, Colorado, and we are, as ever, covering the people, technology, and finance powering the world's communications networks. Today, I am joined by Editor-in-Chief of Light Reading, Ray LaMaitre. Hi, I'm Ray, I've got a beer, and I'm jet-lagged. Excellent, as ever. Uh, and uh, Light Reading <laughs> Editor, Mike Dano. <laughs> So we've got some uh, we've got some talking to do about the Big Five G event. We're at the uh, the end of day one of the event, uh, and uh, first of all, I guess the the, the big uh, the big topic about Big Five G is how are we there yet? Or is it still in the hype cycle? And uh, and I guess is it really going to happen in the way that we've been sold? You know, uh, up up to up till now. Well, I don't think, like, for the early days of 5G, I don't think anybody ever thought or expected or said that it would be everything all at once. Um, what I haven't seen so much of so far is any actual evidence of mass uptake of early services. Now, I know that the... Oh, <laughs> look at that. It's a cold I, one. I feel like I, was, I felt you sneaking behind me. <laughs> we just had a uh, behind-the-back beer handing. Like from Kelsey. our senior editor, yeah. I think K I, Kelsey is the best. It, now, indeed, is what that means. But I think um, there's there's been some reports that with the the, the mass rollout of 5G networks in South Korea, that there's been up to a quarter of a million customer signups just in the first couple of weeks, and obviously that's very encouraging for that market. But they that is a a, a, a smallish market with a lot of very innovative and progressive network operators yeah. who haven't just rolled out a couple of places they've gone like full out All like way. like yeah. almost covering half if not more of the country from the beginning so that's that's quite a different model so i think you know for us to be talking about any knowledge of what 5g is in the early days we need to see more of that level of kind of deployment and then find out actually once if if quarter million of people are using 5g services in south korea are the networks holding up? Is the transport network holding up? Do they actually know who's on the network? What are the analytics like? I know they're not going to tell us, but eventually we need to find out this kind of thing because so far it's been all guesswork. Right. Yeah, and, and it's interesting too because that's, that's not as challenging a geography as uh, you know, North America or Europe. So the you know, propagation, all the radio uh, stuff that has to happen is show me 5G in Wyoming and yeah. then I'll be impressed. <laughs> That's how much I've learned about US geography. Wow. This, uh, yeah, Wyoming. it's impressive. I know. It's very good. Yeah. Uh, my take from, you know, the more, the deeper we get into this and the more I hear at this show and other shows is I feel like we're, we're not even at the first inning. We're at spring training. We're at the spring training before you go to spring training and you're doing stretches before the, before the actual workout of the first day of spring training. For, wow. 5G, it's just... Put that we, on a we, white paper. So we yeah, yeah. just got dressed and we've gotten our massage and now we're, we're yeah. out on the field. Yeah, 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 You might have put on your uniform. That's where we are. We okay. put on our 5G uniform <laughs> to, go, to go to this first spring training. Sometimes I put on my uniform. Prior to any first inning of any game whatsoever. We, do, we don't have... This uh, sounds we, like naked 5G to me. It, it is. It's non-standalone cores. It's, right. it's coverage measured in blocks. It's yeah. one phone. It's... There's there's no improvements in latency. There's, yeah. there, I mean, what do, there, what do we have so far? Yeah, we have been... so little in terms of what we've been talking about and what we've been promised. And there's it's so much further down the road than even next year. I think we have a, a good case for um, localized 5G. We have we have uh, you know the enterprise cases are are, are, are there the the uh, factory floors hospitals, you know, where you can build a network sort of surrounding a single use case and give them great bandwidth and, of course, connect it to fiber because that's really what's, <laughs> what's, what's going to drive the whole thing. I think those will start showing up. Um, they, they, AT&T and Verizon both seem to be really uh, uh, bullish on the business case uh, for that. And they, they both seem to be saying that the business side will drive consumer applications down the road. But 
besides the sort of up in the air, maybe AR, maybe VR, I don't really hear anything on the consumer side for mass adoption at all. Um, I mean, that's all the sexy stuff. We're still very much at the non-sexy stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. how are you going to get some power to that small cell that might actually give you 5G right. at the edge of that block that that's, somebody was talking that's about That's what we're, we're laying fiber to potential locations yeah. for transmitters that may one day be installed at some point in the future, <laughs> probably. <laughs> and then we'll go to the first inning. But that time could be soon. That could be soon. It could be soon. So we'll be talking about it next year, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on the uh, on the on the positive side of the ledger, what what is moving forward in the mobile and the just connectivity in general? Four um, G is better than ever. That's great. Um, wi Fi six and things like uh, Passpoint and Open Reach are are starting to give us a glimpse of what it would be like to actually walk into a hotel and have your phone work right away, which you know. It's it, yeah, it's it's something. You've, maybe there's a sci-fi novel or two out there that, that that address that, but only in vague terms. But this is actually coming, you know, becoming a, a, a real thing. So maybe we're getting closer to solving some of those uh, network hop connectivity issues and that sort of thing. Has anyone heard anything else about uh, uh, you know what's going on in the wider telecom world uh, here at the show? I mean, I, I so I sat in. There were several discussions about fixed wireless. Okay. Uh, at one of the sessions this afternoon that I and I have a soft spot for fixed wireless. I think it's super interesting. Yep. It's a great way to cross the digital divide. I think that's how the rest of the 20 million Americans that are not at all connected are going to be connected. I think there's no doubt about that. Okay. And so I think there's a, a number of companies that are innovating in that fixed wireless space. And, you know, most importantly, it's interesting. It's, it's companies that are, are using wireless technology to challenge uh, established incumbent legacy cable companies. Like, it's just interesting. Yeah. So you put all those things together and I'm like, I'm you're, engaged you're in, that, okay. in that story. We have 4 million customers in the US right now on fixed wireless, like, that's a sizable audience. And if you yeah. can increase those speeds, you know? Yeah, and they're perfect. going from, they're not just going from, uh, uh, you know, dial up to one megabit per second. Right. They're, they're, they're making a massive leap in bandwidth oh, yeah. from, they're from talking nearly nothing. Second, 100 megabits a second, and in some cases a gigabit a second, depending on the spectrum. That they yeah. So like, that's like legit. Those are yeah. legit speeds. Yeah, that is fantastic. Yeah. Okay, Ray, anything? Just, I, I mean, it, for me, it's been interesting to observe where, so we're in the Colorado Convention Center. There's about 1,500 people here today. Yeah. And it was interesting, and the, the keynote sessions this morning were absolutely rammed. And then this afternoon it was the tracks, and some of the tracks you could not get in the door. Yeah. And I went into a session, uh, two minutes I was squeezed at the back before I went out, and it was a really technically detailed discussion about the deployment of optical components for front hall, and people were incredibly engaged. But I think this Did you is say components for front hall? Front yeah. hall. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He's gonna learn he's, he's gonna why? leave and go yeah. see now, yeah. <laughs> yeah really. So I think what what we've what I've seen today is a, a really good mix of people wanting to hear what the big picture is from the, the Verizons and the T Mobiles, etc. But also getting really, really engaged with what the component companies are doing and how they're integrating the specifications like e uh, into their platforms to enable the transport network elements in that case that will support these 5G use cases. So it's been a really good mix today and a lot of people really engaged. I sounded like the marketing for the event there, didn't I? Uh, a little bit, <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, it's true I'm though. Like, for bar there's, there's, everything true. has been crammed. There's keynotes have been crammed, the sessions have been crammed, the show floor is crammed. Like, and there's free beer and in about 15 beer. minutes, this place is going to be heaving. <laughs> that's, that's a good time to break and reload on beers. And we're going to reload on guests, too. Thanks, Mike, for being on the show. Thank you. Uh, we will be right back after this break. We are back on the Light Reading Podcast. I'm still Phil Harvey. That's still Ray LaMaitre. True. And we have a new guest. Who are you and what are you doing here? I, I really, I ask myself that question on a regular basis. I mean, you're not paying me anymore. Why am I here? Were, uh, were we paying you before? Uh, apparently. It's outrageous. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm Mari Silby. I was a senior editor at Light Reading some time ago. I'm now a director of several programs for US Ignite, which is a nonprofit in the smart city space. Very good. Now I'm starting to make the connection as to why, why we're all here. So uh, 5G and smart cities, you don't need one to do the other, but there, there has to be some sort of connection there. Well, the city. Were you just here for the free oh, beer and popcorn? I don't even have it. <laughs> um, no, I mean cities are big consumers of the of broadband connectivity in whatever form it is. And five G having all sorts of new uh, capabilities, at least in theory, the cities and municipalities are going to be big consumers of that. And ultimately, they're the proving ground for what are the use cases? Why do we care about five G? There was a guy um, from the governor's office in Colorado as part of the public safety summit who was talking about the decisions they have to make, the life or death decisions they have to make in like, you know, nanoseconds. And if you don't have the communications network to support that, they can't make those, they don't have the information to make those decisions. Yeah, so it really is life or death when it comes to uh, emergency services, uh, fire and EMT, that sort of thing. So the better the net, the, the low, lower latency networks uh, actually have a big use case there. Um, is and what is US Ignite doing, I guess, to, uh, to sort of connect the circuit here? What, what are they doing to enable that or at least get people talking about it more so they can figure out if it's right for their city? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's a number of different sort of entry points. We work with the municipalities, first of all, to try to figure out, because we firmly believe that the connectivity is the foundation for everything that the cities ultimately want to do. Um, so we work with the municipalities to try to figure out how to make that work. Um, but we also work with the private sector because without the private sector resources and funding, none of this stuff is going to come to light. Um, and then we also work on the technology side to advance the, um, the actual research that goes into taking these technologies to the next level. So one of our folks from one of our programs, we have a number of city scale wireless test beds uh, that are being set up around the country. And one of our folks was here today speaking at the open RAN panel that gave uh, Gabe Brown ran um, and was talking about sort of the different ways that you can um, set up and configure networks, uh, different sort of open RAN configurations and the way you can test them without having to have and own every piece of the ecosystem. If you have a test bed for that and a city scale one at that, you can go in and plug in a component and say, how would this operate in this atmosphere, in this environment? Is everything to scale or the Starbucks cups just smaller? <laughs> oh, look, Kelsey. I heard that the a beer and crackers. <laughs> so uh, for those of you on the audio feed... Uh, Mari Kelsey, won't be speaking anymore. That's right. Kelsey has made another appearance. She's handing off beer and crackers to our guest, Mari. So... Yes. Uh, I forgot it. your question, so I don't... So I don't yeah, no, it's, it, so. it was irrelevant. Yeah, we, I, I think uh, the other question is, you know, as you make the transition from journalism to, uh, to communications in a more professional setting, um, what, what, what could like be more professional get, than this? What, what, what is it like to get paid and to have oh, benefits gosh. and all those things? And to not be on deadline every second of every day. It's, oh, I can tell you hate it. Have a life? You have a life now? I have to have, you know, colleagues I can be proud of. And, you know. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> wow. When um, I said payback time, I thought it was going to be your way around. You know what? <laughs> if I had a heart, that would have hurt. Oh, uh, that, have, oh, that would have really hurt. Yeah. So I, I have to say the the crackers you were handed are absolutely banned during the podcast. No no crunching on on. Uh, as long as I can have the beer. This isn't one of those ASMR things. This is just uh, this is just talking about five G. <laughs> anyway, um, Ray, you've been awfully silent except except to uh, uh, abuse her about her 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 new uh, occupation. Um, how do you how do you sort of you know speaking of hype cycles. How do you sort of process what's going on with, we've been talking about smart cities forever, and in my mind, like, there's very few instances where things have advanced down to the level of somebody walking through and going, wow, this place is so different than I was here five years ago. Yeah, uh, well, it all comes down to money, doesn't it? I mean, everybody's got a plan. Most cities have committees and task forces and other bullshit names like that. But basically it comes down to getting some money and putting the money into projects and making things work. And right. so London is a fantastic example where I think they've had a smart city task force for maybe four or five years. I'm sure they meet and have a great dinner every yes. now and again. But to do discuss. they get free beer and crackers? Absolutely <laughs> not. But I think mostly they must discuss what they haven't done. 
because there is absolutely zero difference. Obviously, the mobile networks have evolved and gotten better and so on and so forth. But that's happening without any task force or people talking about smart cities. So now, so in the UK, I'm starting to see some implementation of um, smart highways yeah. where there is uh, the, uh, analytics and compute cap capabilities being laid alongside the, the major uh, motorways or highways uh, in the UK. But, um, you know, I, th I think London boasts itself as being an incredibly smart city, but I'm in London every week and I see no evidence <laughs> of it whatsoever. Is that the city uh, itself or is that the people in the city? Well, it's the city itself, of course. I have to go back there, Mari. I, yeah, I, right. Yeah, you don't want to don't, don't ruin it for him. Well, I, the millions of people in London that will be mis listening to this podcast mm, would kill me, right. of course, yeah. if this I said anything about that. If overseas yeah. includes Ohio, that's... Uh, that's right. <laughs> but, I mean, it... But seriously, it, it comes down to money because you can talk until you're blue in the face about all this stuff. But unless somebody puts some, some dollars or, or yen or pounds or euros right. behind it, it's pointless. I agree. It's going to come down to what? Public-private partnerships, right? I mean, did I just steal your thunder? No, I no, you're, you, you just, thunder? I don't have That'd thunder. Oh. Lightning, but it's in the shape of that, uh, the, the light reading logo, so. The lightning bolt. The lightning bolt Fantastic. that is light reading. No, I was just going to say that uh, transportation is a good example because that's where cities or whatever governmental entities are used to spending money. So there, there are budgets. They have a sense of like long-term capital expenditures. And if you can weave in smart right. things into that, that's that's the kind of thing that gets done at this point. Right. Um, I also think it's interesting to watch where, you know, the governments are starting to put money. If you look at all the grant funding cycles from all the different various federal agencies that are out there, and you see where the government's saying, hey, and the Department of Transportation is a good example, where they're putting money, all of a sudden that starts to uh, catalyze what happens at both the city level and also at the private sector level to say, okay, well, if there's money there, then let's bring resources together, let's get matching resources, let's see what we can do and actually make something tangible out of it. Let's see how we can get some of that money. <laughs> that's right, yes. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty good place to leave it right now. So well, I should uh, just yeah, before, ahead. I disparage London, oh. but there are actually other places in the UK that, that are actually making progress and doing things with smart cities. Bristol is one example. There's another, Milton Keynes, and there's a few others where they have really good local projects. But London, obviously, I live near London. It should be the smartest city in the UK. I don't see any evidence of that, but there are other places, so I just wanted to point that out. Fantastic. The UK might be going down the toilet with Brexit, but um, you know there is some smart city development going on. Smart toilet, that'd be fun. Oh my gosh, I've started another conversation I don't want to end. Okay, here we go. We need to, we need to wrap it up here at the 5G event. So what have we learned today? We've learned that uh, we're very optimistic about 5G, but we're also very skeptical. I want to thank our guest, uh, Mike Dano, and Mari Silby, thanks so much for coming back and enduring all of this. And of course, Smart Cities requires lots of money, as does 5G. If you've been watching this online, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for supporting the big 5G event and lightreading.com. If you've been listening to this, you there with the headphones, thanks so much for letting us invade your personal space. We will see you again soon. Bye.